Good afternoon, everyone. We are just a couple minutes early ahead of when we're going to get started. So um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to hear where you're logging in from, what is your connection to rural grocery, and we will get started in, in just a few minutes. Be sure when you do um, enter your introductions in the chat that you uh, select the option to send your message to everyone, not just the hosts and presenters. That way we can all see. So we will get started in just a couple minutes. Welcome everyone. We still have just a few minutes before we'll get started, but please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, uh, share where you are logging in from, and what is your connection to Rural Grocery. We'll give everyone a couple minutes to get uh, logged in, and then we will get started. Hello everyone. Uh, we just hit the we're just about to hit the 130 mark and I'm seeing that uh, we've got quite a few people joining us now jumping on right as we hit 130. Um, please introduce yourself and we'll get started in just a few minutes. I think we will go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us and welcome to our fourth webinar in this year's 
Rural Grocery Succession Planning monthly webinar series. Uh, my name is Ryle Carver and I'm the program leader for the Rural Grocery Initiative. The Rural Grocery Initiative is housed at K-State Research and Extension and we work throughout, the, throughout Kansas and the country uh, towards the mission of sustaining locally owned rural grocery stores to enhance community vitality and improve access to healthy food. So we are going to get started with um, this webinar, with today's webinar. And as I mentioned earlier, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. So our office uh, knows that this topic of rural grocery transition planning is hugely relevant to small towns across the country. And with many grocery stores nearing retirement age, uh, there's really a huge opportunity for communities to be thinking proactively about the next phase of their grocery store's life. Um, and so still though, we know that this is a, a complex and challenging process. And so this monthly webinar series aims to demystify the process of transition planning, connect grocers and communities to relevant resources and content experts, and hopefully support smooth rural grocery ownership transitions. Over the past year and a half, uh, the Rural Grocery Initiative has hosted a dozen webinars focused on various aspects of transition planning for rural grocery stores. Each webinar highlights a content expert and showcases a real world example of a grocery store uh, going through a transition or thinking about preparing for a transition. So we're building a knowledge base so that if and when a grocer or community is faced with a transition, we have resources and stories to help you all through that. And so please um, visit our website, ruralgrocery.org. We have a variety of resources available there uh, that are connected to this topic. But before we get into today's topic, I do wanna highlight our sponsor, we thank the Ewing Marion Coffin Foundation for making this webinar series possible. And in terms of housekeeping, um, this webinar is being recorded. So this will be posted um, later this week on our website at ruralgrocery.org under the events tab. And we will leave some time at the end for Q&A. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature to post your questions for the presenters and we will get to those. So when a transition takes place from one owner to a next, it is an opportunity to reimagine the role that the store plays in that community and consider ways for the store to go beyond grocery to address the needs of the community. So today we are very excited to have Jim Dudlisek join us from the National Grocers Association. Jim is the Director for Communications and External Affairs for NGA and will be sharing what this looks like from a national perspective. Before I turn it over to Jim, I just want to mention um, that we'll also have my colleague Erica sharing just a brief um, snapshot into some of the examples that we've seen from the Rural Grocery Initiative of grocers going beyond uh, to provide for their communities. And then we also have uh, Bonnie and Theo Ramsey joining us today. They are the owners of Ramsey's Market. They have two grocery stores in, based in Iowa and have implemented a variety of innovative strategies to help sustain and enhance their store's offerings, including hardware and food lockers and much more. Um, of course, as I just said, we'll have Q&A at the end. So, Without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Jim and he will get us started for the day. Great, thank you very much. So happy to be here. Um, as has been said, I'm Jim Dudlasek. I'm the Director of Communications for the National Grocers Association. Uh, I've been with NGA for uh, just a little over two years, actually two years this month. Before then, I spent 10 years on the editorial team at Progressive Grocer Magazine. Uh, during that time, I have had opportunities to meet and visit with 
grocery retailers from urban areas to Indian reservations. So I uh, met a lot of great people with a lot of um, innovative thinking and ways of doing business. It's a great industry to be a part of, and I'm happy to continue uh, on this side of, uh, of the business. So um, hope that I can share some interesting information with you today. Next slide, please. Just wanted to sort of provide a summary in advance of what we'll be getting into. Uh, first, just some changes in the retail landscape over the past few years that affects the entire industry, rural as well as other areas. Uh, then some of the new trends that are impacting rural grocery. And then finally, uh, some of the competitive challenges, uh, again, that are um, common to, uh, to retailers operating uh, in the grocery sector. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, just wanted to, uh, for the benefit of those who might not be familiar with the National Grocery Association, wanted to let you know a little bit about who we are. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C. We represent uh, independent community grocers uh, in every congressional district across the country. Uh, basically, any store from single store to small regional chains that are privately held um, and are not uh, part of the national uh, chains uh, or big box stores. Uh, we also represent uh, their wholesaler partners and some of the suppliers of goods and services to the sector. Uh, each year, independent grocers, uh, which are quite plentiful in rural areas of the country, they account for about a third of all annual grocery sales, according to the uh, uh, intermittent studies that we do. Uh, and um, our main goal is to advocate for the growth and continuing innovation of community grocers uh, and providing good educational content on best practices and trends and so forth uh, so they can do their business better. Uh, we have about 1,700 retailer member companies and more than 30 wholesalers that represent more than 8,500 storefronts across the United States, as well as Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, and there are about 21,000 independent community grocers in the United States. And uh, also on your screen, there's a little bit of a snapshot, um, just a couple of ways uh, independent grocers impact the national economy, providing well over a million jobs. Uh, that generate over $40 billion in wages every year and about $255 billion to the US economy. So independent grocers are a strong economic force in the country. Next slide, please. Uh, here is just a small sampling of the kinds of companies who are our members. Uh, you'll probably recognize some of these names. Uh, they stretch from coast to coast as well as the heartland. Uh, some great uh, independent regional retailers uh, and also some uh, wholesalers as well. Uh, so, um, you know, we've got, uh, we've got both coasts covered and we've got the heartland. Uh, so that's just, uh, just a very small sampling of, of who we represent. Next slide, please. So we'll get started with some of the changes in the retail landscape. First of all, the pandemic. Obviously, you can't talk about changes to retail now without reflecting on what has gone on the past two years. Um, you know, sitting here now, say two years and two months ago, no one could have probably anticipated what was about to follow. Um, and uh, it's, it's been an interesting ride, uh, to say the least. Uh, the pandemic drove record supermarket sales because with restaurants shut down for a lot of that time, consumers were forced to eat more meals at home. Um, and as part of that, um, e-commerce just exploded. Um, before the pandemic, we're looking at growth levels uh, of e-commerce and household acceptance. What most folks thought was going to take five years happened in a matter of months, because all of a sudden, even though grocery was deemed an essential industry, an essential business, and was allowed to remain open, a lot of people were not comfortable, as you know, shopping in person. Um, so all of a sudden, everybody was shopping online. Um, huge growth in that area. And you had a lot of grocers, in particular in the independent sector, who not only might not have had online shopping available, but might not have had, had little or no web presence. Um, and luckily, uh, the independent community is innovative enough that they can pivot. And a lot of them did almost literally overnight launching, some of them did, online shopping platforms, whether that's for pickup or delivery, um, to take on that demand uh, for people hesitant to shop in person. 
Um, so that was a, a huge, uh, huge event that happened uh, as a result of the pandemic, uh, much faster than it was anticipated uh, otherwise. Uh, last few years, we've seen a bigger emphasis in fresh. Um, part of this is because of e-commerce. Part of this is because of uh, um, just the uh, increase in um, competitive channels. Uh, so folks are finding grocery and other uh, um, and other things elsewhere. Uh, so most of the investment for grocery has come in the fresh perimeter. Uh, fresh produce, bakery, deli, meat. When you enter a store, that's what provides the tactile experience of why you want to be in the store, the sights, the aromas. And that's where most of the investment has gone into. Uh, and even despite the inroads of e-commerce, uh, that part of the store, the fresh areas, really remain a draw for in-person shoppers, even folks that... Um, um, that might be buying other things uh, uh, online. Um, people still want to pick out their own steak. They want to pick out their own produce. Um, you know, with the inroads of e-commerce, um, there's been a little bit more trust uh, in buying fresh sight unseen, but people still want to get back in the stores. And as, as things have opened up after the pandemic, people are back shopping in stores again. Uh, so things have sort of leveled off. E-commerce is, I think, moving forward. It's it's going to be more part. Uh, it's more universally accepted, uh, and it's going to be part of a whole library of choices that people have to shop based on what their needs are at an individual time. Sometimes they're going to want to want to go to the store in person. Sometimes it's just not in their schedule, so they have that option. Um, and then, of course, as an adjunct to the emphasis on fresh. Uh, you've, we've had over the past few years an increase in the, uh, the growth of prepared foods, restaurant quality foods, to the extent that some stores are even having in-store dining. Now, that did take a hit during the pandemic. Uh, that kind of slowed down any self-serve areas or where people would congregate. Uh, so grocers were able to pivot to providing that same kind of selection, but in a grab-and-grow uh, pre-packaged format. Um, but that's, that's going to continue to be a huge part of that because um, it's an important part of the offerings of meal solutions, not just a big building full of ingredients, but a place where people know that they can solve the problem, for lack of a better term, of a meal that they need to put on the table that evening. Next slide, please. A pandemic brought, obviously, many shifts in consumer behavior, uh, drove an increase in grocery spending. Um, huge. Uh, as of, uh, these are uh, statistics from last March, um, after about a year into the pandemic, a 14% increase in household grocery spending at that time. Uh, that number's had some ebbs and flows based on when lockdowns have eased up or come back again based on the latest wave, uh, but it's been pretty consistent, particularly after last fall when we had the last surge, um, folks are shopping more for eating at home. Um, and again, almost half of consumers say they, they cook more frequently now. Uh, we're seeing maybe a little bit of burnout in that area, but still uh, people are eating at home more and more. Um, in particular now, the, uh, as inflation continues to spiral, that's having an impact as well. Um, even though inflation directed at grocery is higher than restaurant inflation, it's still less expensive to eat at home. Uh, people are shopping more local. They trust local grocery stores. They trust the independent grocer, their local community store, because um, you know it's part of a larger, uh, part of a smaller organization that's in the community, and they know where their food is coming from. And obviously, what I already mentioned about e-commerce is surging. Um, all of grocery retail had record sales in, in, during 2020, uh, that first full year of the pandemic. Um, but the pandemic also brought consumers back to independent grocers in greater numbers, as I mentioned, because uh, they tend to trust the smaller operator more. Uh, and quite honestly, independent grocers, um, particularly in rural areas, they really are an entrenched part of the community and they know how to take care of their communities in times of crisis. Um, whether that's a pandemic, whether that's a natural disaster, um, they're such an ingrained part of the community. Next slide, please. Pandemic also um, forced some shifts in retail operations, some obvious, some not. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, self-serve items like salad bars and food bars were suspended, substituted with packaged grab-and-go items. Uh, you had e-commerce platforms established. 
uh, some assisted by third party providers like an Instacart. And then some folks went on their own with help from firms out there like Rosie that uh, provide uh, solutions uh, sort of turnkey where uh, retailers could have their own branded solutions uh, for e-commerce. Uh, also the pandemic and subsequently the supply chain issues that continue to this day um, forced a lot of retailers to find alternative sources uh, for goods that were in high demand. All of a sudden, a lot of things, you know, it's become cliche now, but where do you get toilet paper? But it was, it went well beyond that. Um, one of the main areas was the restaurant supply channel. With restaurants closed, those products had to go somewhere and grocers were able to take advantage of that. Uh, so, and independents really put the pandemic, their pandemic sales gains to good use. There was a lot of improvements made in capital expenditures. Um, surprisingly, new stores, even at the time where a lot of businesses were closed, well, it took that time to do a lot of remodels and uh, pay down debt as well. Uh, and of course, the pandemic meant enhanced, enhanced sanitizing procedures. And as a matter of trust and comfort to their customers, that's something that quite rightfully so, I think, is going to continue for the foreseeable future. Because after what we've been through with the pandemic, people are going to want to know that they're shopping in a safe environment. Next slide, please. Some of the new trends affecting rural grocery. Um, you know, rural consumers face a lot of challenges finding access to, to retail food stores. Uh, some of these regions have, you know, low population, high poverty rates. It's hard to make a go of a business there. Um, so that's, you know, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, single, single location grocery stores, which a lot of our members are, uh, as opposed to chain stores, they make up a large percentage of grocery stores in, in rural uh, areas as opposed to uh, urban areas. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it, that, that continues that challenge when, uh, you know, you're kind of out there going it alone. Um, but yet, uh, rural grocers, traditional grocers face a lot of competition from convenience stores, specialty stores, dollar stores, uh, big boxes, um, you know, particularly Walmart, um, large stores like that coming in. And, you know, within the past 20 years, you've gone from, you know, these channels being almost not represented at all to taking up huge chunks and um, really providing a challenge to the small traditional grocer to stay in business. It's just, you know, just a matter of scale. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but there are advantages that the small town grocer can, can leverage. Uh, the local foods trend, uh, you're out in a rural area, you're out closer to farm country where the food comes from. Um, so grocers can always leverage that. In many cases, they know the farmers personally who they're uh, procuring uh, their produce from and other products. Uh, so they can use that uh, as part of that brand story because consumers, particularly younger ones coming up now, they embrace that kind of uh, that authentic story behind a, a business. Uh, they want to know there's there's something more to a business than just a name and just making money. Uh, and they appreciate food that is you know simple, uh, clean label, not a lot of ingredients. Uh, so you can use that closeness and that locality as a good marketing tool. Uh, and rural grocers can also focus on the in-store experience. Uh, you know, getting back to you think of the the old days of people gathering on the front porch of the general store. Today's rural grocer can be just that, uh, be that social anchor for the community. And a lot of stores that are, you know, trying to capitalize on getting people into the stores when they're losing sales to e-commerce, provide more services to be that social nexus uh, in a community, whether it's, um, you know, having a, a wine bar or food tastings, any kind of events related to food. Uh, and then also diversifying too with other services and different product offerings as uh, speakers that will follow me will provide a great example of. Uh, next slide, please. And then of course, uh, you probably already know this because this webinar is part of an ongoing series on succession planning, but you know, um, and, and this, this is an issue that is, is not just affecting rural grocers, but I think family run grocery stores anywhere. Um, Quite frankly, grocery is a hard sell as a career to younger generations. And that's been one of the challenges of the industry overall. And one of the things that NGA through its NGA foundation uh, has focused on 
in uh, trying to play up the benefits and the values of going into grocery uh, as, as a long-term career, particularly for younger people who are being looked to now to take on businesses as the next generation and move them to the next place that they need to go. And a lot of times it's these fresh ideas and fresh eyes that are needed to take a business to that next step. And it could be the difference between a business going away and continuing and thriving uh, and being that that center that uh, a community relies upon, especially when there aren't a lot of other choices nearby. Um, you're going to be serving a younger demographic, so it's better that those younger folks can propel the business and guide it knowing what folks like them uh, want to experience. Next slide, please. And of course, as I mentioned before, super centers, dollar stores, they're a huge competitive force. Um, you know, there are cases that we know of that they're, you know, they're driving, um, uh, driving smaller stores out of business. Uh, this, their immense scale, they're able to dominate on low price, makes it very hard for smaller stores to compete. And it's forcing people to drive greater and greater distances to buy things, especially fresh foods um, in less populated areas. Next slide, please. So, right, good segue into competitive challenges. Um, fragmented market, huge fragmented market, especially within the, within the last, you know, two decades. Um, traditional grocery used to have a hold on that at-home food market. It's slowly chipping away because you have, uh, you know, it's not enough for grocers to compete against each other now. Now they have to compete with mass retailers, big box, club stores. Dollar stores are moving more fresh foods in. Even home improvement stores, those of you might be familiar with, with Menards out of Wisconsin, you can get milk and refrigerated groceries there. Um, so, so many more places. So a, a grocery store really has to sort of place themselves on this continuum of quality selection, experience, service, and convenience. Um, what do they need to hit to be, to, to prove to potential consumers that they are a valuable part of, uh, of a you know place where they can capitalize on that food dollar. Um, labor, an enormous challenge right now. Nationwide labor shortage. Um, it's bad enough that, that grocery stores, a lot of them don't have enough folks to, to cover all the shifts that they need to cover, but they're competing with other stores for a diminishing pool of talent because people have left the workforce and it makes it harder and harder, harder to maintain that high level of service. Uh, hiring and retention are are the top marketplace concerns among a lot of our members. They've told us this straight out. Uh, they can't get good people, they can't keep them. Hiring during the pandemic has been a challenge and, and retention has been a challenge as well. Um, food deserts are an issue. Um, challenge of operating in less populated areas. It's driving small operators out of business again because of the superstores that come in. Um, and then this issue about lacks in antitrust enforcement, uh, this is something that NGA is very passionate about and that we are waging a campaign on. Um, for uh, years, um, the, uh, the authorities have not been enforcing uh, antitrust laws such as the Robinson-Patman Act, which were designed to protect smaller operators in the face of large-scale operators. Um, and the, the pandemic really amplified the impact of the challenge of being able to source goods um, when you're forced to compete with the power buyers of larger chains uh, who force suppliers into exclusive arrangements and um, make it harder for smaller independent and rural grocers to procure the kinds of goods that they need at the prices uh, that they and their customers can afford. Uh, just a continued challenge. So next slide, please. Looking ahead, some of the future expectations uh, we foresee for the industry, in-home eating is gonna continue. Um, you know, the pandemic gave it a jump start. We think that's gonna continue at least as long as inflation continues uh, to be an issue uh, for people looking to save money um, instead of going out as often as they had been. Um, you can expect grocers to, to uh, offer more grab and go options as a convenience. Um, and inflation is gonna to continue to put pressure on, uh, on shoppers. Uh, leaning in on local, uh, local products, people are, are, are gonna see that as a bonus, see it as a matter of uh, loyalty and trust when choosing a, a retailer to give their business to. 
uh, during the pandemic, independents leaned on a lot of local sources to keep their shelves stocked and really enhance their relationships with, with farmers and, and uh, owners of local uh, supply companies. And that's gonna continue to grow in, in, uh, in importance for the industry. Uh, next slide, please. Providing a seamless e-commerce experience. Um, anyone who um, had to launch something during the pandemic or anyone who had something that wasn't fully developed, uh, they're gonna need to invest more into making it better, um, come up with new innovative ways uh, to strengthen their fulfillment infrastructure, uh, strategies for being different from competitors. Uh, it's not going to be enough just to be an Instacart member. Uh, you're going to need to, you know, to go over and above to, to show your differentiation. Uh, associates need to be trained, again, in a, <laughs> an added issue being the labor shortage for that, but getting the right people to really drive that good customer experience. Value and convenience, there's no one size fits all. It depends on the community you serve. Uh, especially now with inflation, people are looking to stretch their dollars and they're gonna be looking to grocers for the best ways to do that. And grocery retailers need to be there to help guide folks uh, towards the best values. Um, and you know, it's a challenge not only for, for consumers but for the grocers themselves because all you grocers out there know you're operating on slim margins and, and you know, inflation is hurting you as well as, as, as well as customers. I think there's probably a lot of folks in the public not familiar with the industry who think, oh, prices are increasing, so grocers are making money hand over fist. It's costing them more and the margins are just as slim. So that's that's part of that communication. People need to understand that we're you know all in this together. Next slide, please. Um, and I'll finish, finish up with this final expectation for the future. Uh, people, uh, consumers are going to look for a greater increasing degree of transparency. Um, you need to get their trust in order to get their loyalty, in order to get their, their dollars left in your store. Um, so they're going to want to know that you operate in, you know, in a straightforward, upright manner, that you're more than just making money, that you're a pillar of the community, um, that you understand their needs and the issues that they find important and they'll reward you with their business. Um, so I hope that has provided a, a decent picture of what has been, what is, and what we expect to come. And with that, I'll turn things over to Erica. All right, well, thank you so much, Jim, for providing that you know, high level 30,000 foot view of what's going on in the retail industry and what that means for rural grocers. So, Doing your research and understanding the current trends is, is all part of business transition planning because that's going to help inform what your next steps are and how you should plan on running your business. So that's really why we wanted to start the webinar today with that broad overview. And in addition to you know, understanding these industry trends, we wanted to use this webinar to help folks think about different ways they can remain competitive. Um, because as you all know, as we just heard, um, the grocery industry is changing, it's challenging, and it's even harder for rural grocers that are competing with these big chain supermarkets. Um, and again, this all relates back to the theme of the webinar, webinar series, because staying competitive and building value is all part of business transition planning. Next slide. So when you're Preparing for transition, there are a few things that you want to ask yourself. What are my financial goals? If, for example, selling the business is going to help fund your retirement, what do you hope to get out of it? So what do you want the selling price to be? And if the business sale is not enough to fulfill your financial needs, how will you build value before exiting? So this is obviously something that you need to think about well in advance of exiting a business. And I just wanna highlight that last bullet point that being innovative and building community support now is key. Um, and that's really one of the main takeaways from this entire webinar series that you really want to start planning for business transition early in order to get the best outcome. So now what we're going to do for the remainder of the webinar is look at some different innovative ways rural grocers have gone beyond grocery to stay competitive and build value. 
So, you know, in addition to selling groceries, which obviously is very important all on its own, um, what are some other things grocers can do to build community support and customer loyalty? Um, how can grocers differentiate themselves and stay relevant and draw customers into their store? So on the next slide, um, I'm gonna share some examples. Um, so this might include offering products and services that aren't strictly grocery items, like locally made products and postage stamps, um, having a cafe or deli, which will give you higher margin items and, and uh, you know, people who are going into the store to pick those things up are likely going to pick up groceries on their way out as well. Um, we've also seen grocery stores co-locating with other businesses like pharmacies, floral shops, banks. And in just a few minutes, we're going to hear about a grocery store that's partnering with a hardware store. So these are offerings beyond grocery, drawing people in for different reasons and driving up foot traffic. Next slide. Um, and then we've also seen grocery stores engaging with their communities in various ways. Um, which is helping them have a stronger presence and more visibility and helping them, you know, establish themselves as a fixture in the community. So this could look like displaying local art in the store, having a little library at the store. Um, in the first webinar of this series, we heard from the Mildred store, which hosts a monthly music night that draws people in from out of town into their community. And then, you know, cookouts in the parking lot. Um, and then, of course, we have all probably seen grocery stores partner with local organizations and sponsor various community events by donating food or uh, selling food at a discounted price. So these are all different things that an independent, locally owned grocery store can do that probably their big chain competitor isn't going to do that is going to set them apart. Next slide. So now we're very excited because we get to feature two grocers who are being innovative in many different ways. We have Bonnie and Theo Ramsey with us, um, and they're with Ramsey's Market in Manning and Lenox, Iowa. Um, and they're going to share with us how they got into the world of grocery, what it means to them and what they are doing to stay on top of the trends and adapt so that their stores and the communities that they serve can thrive. Um, so, and just a reminder to everybody here, if you have questions that come up, again, please feel free to post them in the chat or the Q&A box, um, and we will have time toward the end of the webinar to get to those questions. Um, so Bonnie and Theo, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. We're happy to be here. Um, we will do our best to uh, tell you a little bit about our story and what we've been uh, trying to do over the last several years to, um, you know, be, be that social place in town and uh, a, a good option for groceries uh, for the communities that we're we are serving. Um, we uh, moved back, Bonnie's from, uh, from Iowa, and we moved back to her hometown and uh, this grocery store in Lenox came up for, for sale and we um, decided to go ahead and give it a go. Uh, it, it wasn't that simple, but we decided to go ahead and, and, and give it a go and, and, and see what we could do. Um, so but that was back in 2015. Um, since then, we have purchased um, Ace Hardware uh, that was in 2019. We purchased another grocery store in Manning, Ram Ramsey's Market in Manning in 2020. And um, in 2021, we launched a grocery delivery service called Fresh Out of the Box. Um, we can go ahead and uh, move ahead on some slides. Yeah. So this was our first week in the grocery business. <laughs> uh, we were, our heads were swimming so much we couldn't even see straight. But um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. These are just some pictures. Um, this is our, our store in Manning, Iowa. Uh, we're a full service uh, grocery store from meat to deli to bakery um, in both locations. Um, we add a lot of uh, decor um, in each, uh, each location just to add a hometown feel. Um, you can do the next slide. Um, you can see our hardware store um, on the right, and on the left is the grocery store in Lenox. Um, we have added U-Hauls to um, 
an offering. Uh, it's functioning out of the ACE hardware, um, but it's just another service that we provide. Yeah, and as, you, as we go through this conversation, there's a, a yeah, as we go through this conversation, um, that's really the biggest part is um, getting to know your community. What does your community need? And um, you'll try some things on, some things will work, some things won't. And, um, and that's important to know too. But we just want to make sure we're adding services that are of value and um, making the best uh, use of the space that we have. Because um, as, as we all know, rural grocery is, is a tough, uh, it, it's not the same as it used to be. Um, it's it's tough. You've got to figure out ways to be creative and um, add even more value to the community than than just the grocery side of it. Yeah. So when we um, got into the grocery business, um, we're going into our eighth year. Um, the location there on the left, Ramsey's Market, you see with the red barn, um, that was our first store. Um, and we are entertainers by nature. Um, we performed for the United States Air Force for. Um, gosh, eight years before we jumped into the grocery world. Um, so we had marketing and entertainment background behind us. And so, um, you know, like we talked about earlier in the, in the presentation, we tried to have the grocery store be a social area. We did lots of music. We've done lots of music. Um, this is a pre, uh, where we serve to the community um, hamburgers. We had a live entertainment there on the right. Uh, we coordinated with the the county cattlemen to come in um, to work with them on that as well. So we do lots of events. You can go to the. And this one was during the pandemic. Um, right. That's what it was drive up burgers. What you're seeing here is um, in our Ace Hardware. We're the only Ace Hardware store in the United States that has a taco um, and a bar. So you can buy um, a lawnmower and have a beer at the same time in the hardware store. Um, this was just a little um, post that we had done um, advertising. Uh, well, you can read it. Um, but we try to do kind of stuff outside of the box. Um, we try to push the envelope just a little bit on, on stuff that we're doing to bring folks in to make it a fun environment. Um, we're always thinking outside of the box, I guess, if you could say. Um, that's our taco bar and Ace Hardware. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is a shot of the hardware store. It's a fully branded Ace Hardware, um, and it's four feet from the grocery store. Um, just to give you an idea of the size of the hardware store. This was an old gymnasium. Um, it was a school gymnasium and we rehabbed this um, in the middle of the night <laughs> um, as we, we redid the store from top to bottom um, and brought it back to the original. This is in the back of the hardware store. So we talk about doing things kind of outside of the box. We hosted a painting class in the hardware store um, where folks would sign up and come paint. Um, this is the back of our retail right there. Um, so we're always doing something a little bit different just to bring people in. This was a pop-up store as we have pop-up store night where we invited um, local retailers to come in to promote their, their, um, their things. We had a class reunion. Yep, uh, we hosted a 1969 class reunion one night where we had a whole class come in and have their party there at the Ace Hardware. This was my husband being the bartender. <laughs> and really anything that you can do to, yeah, don't be afraid to wear as many hats as you need to. Um, there, we're just trying to, you know, as a community, we're just trying to have a good life, make it all happen. And as many things as you can do to bring them in and um, be connected to your, to, to what you're offering, um, the, the better chance you have of, right. of keeping things rolling. So this right here, you're seeing the Santa. So every Christmas, as an idea, um, we uh, put out a post and we ask everybody to sign up for Santa Claus. Um, we bake hundreds of cookies and Santa, we actually get in our cars and we go to everybody's household caroling. Santa comes to the door and we hand out cookies to the family. They can request how many cookies they would like. Um, it's usually a week long thing um, that we visit, I don't know, 100 houses. Um, singing carols and delivering cookies from Ramsey's Market. Um, so we try to do things um, as personal as well as we can, as well as abroad marketing as well. Um, it's really all about attention. You, you know, there are so many things that are um, in everybody's face all the time. There's, and people have so many options now, and that's um, why you have to continue to be innovative and think of ways to 
be a part of people's daily lives. Yes. Um, so we, eight years ago, when we jumped in this business, um, we knew that the landscape for grocery was changing and we could see that the grocery business, um, if we didn't change what we were doing, we weren't going to make it. Um, and so three years ago, we had been on a date and we ended up talking about work anyway and came up with this concept um, of fresh out of the box. Um, we knew that grocery was going to delivery. Um, we, I'm an Iowa girl and I was seeing food deserts pop up left and right. And we knew it was a real concern and how could we, um, how could we help those food deserts? Um, we have grocery stores and we have a hardware store, but our heart and our passion is community um, stability and revitalization and um, trying to keep those towns vibrant so that they can still have industry in town and schools and how important the fresh food in town is. Um, it is like the foundation of that community. Once you lose your fresh food, man, all of your other services start crumbling within a couple of years from our research that we found. So trying to get those food deserts um, serviced and becoming non-food deserts um, was really our goal with this project. So we came up with this concept. You're looking at our food locker fresh out of the box. Um, we put these down in some surrounding communities um, and that takes them out of that food desert status because now we're delivering fresh food in town. Right, we, um, as you get into the grocery industry, um, you may find that you're, becoming more of an economic developer and in, interested in um, community-wide efforts to keep the entire community thriving, not just your own business. Yes. So um, this is the locker. You're seeing half of it on the left where it says Crochet and Hardware is um, freezers. And on the right where it says daily delivery, those are coolers. Um, folks order by 5 p.m. Um, then we, we cut that meat fresh that night, we bake those items fresh that night, and then we deliver them first thing in the morning the next day. Um, we're open seven days a week, um, so we deliver seven days a week. Uh, they get a text message uh, when their order has been picked, and they just uh, walk up to the screen, punch in their code, and the lockers will light up. Um, you can see the little lights there on the doors. Um, they'll light up, and the door pops open for them. Um, their security on it as well. So it's nice and safe. And um, yeah, am I missing anything on the lockers? No. Nope. No, I mean, the if you are looking there, the 15 doors on the left are frozen, the 15 on the right are refrigerated so they can get a wide variety of whatever it is they need. We can put um, whatever hardware that people might want as well. You can put power tools, paint, all of that can last uh, two or three days. Uh, we, we verified that with our suppliers. There's some people that won't like that answer, but we, I've tried it. You can put paint in there. It lasts. It's, it's, it's still great. Yeah. So um, here's a video um, that kind of shows you the process. A fresh box refrigerated food locker like this one here in Walnut could be a small town's answer to living in a food desert. I think it's a good thing for the community. David Krieger, who has lived in Walnut for more than three decades, tells us Walnut has not had a grocery store in years. He says the refrigerated food locker is needed. It's certainly convenient for our elderly citizens that you know, don't get out. Theo Ramsey and his wife, who have grocery stores in Lenox and Manning, have been marinating on this idea to shrink the state's food deserts for the last three years. We wanted to see what we could do to potentially help, uh, given the, the resources that we have. Here is how Fresh Out of the Box works. You go online to place your order. If you order by 5 in the evening, your food will be delivered to the locker the very next morning. You will get a notification your delivery is ready and a code. You punch in your code and the lights above the doors your order is in will light up. This is a grocery option Walnut's mayor gives his full support. It's an experiment, but you know, you, you got to be bold. And this is cutting edge. The refrigerated food locker in Walnut will be serviced by the Ramsey's grocery store in Lenox. Make no mistake, this is an effort to grow the business, but it is not all dollars and cents. It's important to be able to keep the lights on and, and uh, make some money, but it is what is going to last is when you're, you have that passion for what you're doing and you believe in what you're doing. This is the first fresh box refrigerated food locker. The next one will open later this week in Shelby. 
In Walnut, Marcus McIntosh, KCCI 8 News, Iowa's News Leader. Now, by the way, this is part of a pilot program that will put eight food lockers in small Iowa towns with the hopes of serving 32 communities. Yeah, so that kind of gives you an uh, overview of, of our, our pilot program that we've launched. Um, this is our kiddos. It is definitely a family effort for sure. Um, they're up in all the discussions at midnight and they also help us <laughs> When we get in the trucks to go deliver sometimes uh, so this was a parade that we were in but these are the trucks that we deliver in um they're they're fully refrigerated um here's just another view of the locker the next slide yeah so that's the screen that you would that you would uh get your order out of and this was the first night that we saw it lit up so <laughs> <laughs> uh when you live and breathe it it's it's wonderful to see the lights on so Anyway, that's kind of an overview of what we're what we've been doing um, to add extra services um, and be as innovative as we can. We know that this is the our answer for now, but we also know that we've already made steps of how we need to innovate in the next couple of years. It's always just trying to be up on the forefront. Yeah, and you don't want to just be creative with your uh, service offerings. You want to be creative with your business partnerships, your uh, funding opportunities, anything that you can to make sure that it all um, comes together uh, is what you got to do. It's And, and there's no step-by-step -step roadmap. You just have to get in there and figure out what the needs are and, and go for it. Run as fast as you can. Okay, Erica. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bonnie and Theo, for sharing with us, you know, all that you're doing, all of the innovative things that you're doing to adapt and serve your community and stay relevant. And it's just really inspiring to hear all of that. So yeah, we have time now. Um, now that we're kind of toward the end of the webinar, we have time for questions. So it, for folks in the audience, feel free to type your question in the chat. Um, I do have, and if Bonnie and, and Jim, if you want to turn your videos back on, um, I wanted to start out asking a question about your partnership with Ace Hardware. And Jim, um, I know when we started talking about this webinar, we were kind of discussing uh, different things that grocers have been doing, innovative things grocers have been doing. And for those in the audience who don't know, um, ACE has been partnering with grocery stores across the country. So Jim, first of all, I was wondering if you might be able to share just a little bit of background about that program, if you will. And then Bonnie and Theo, I was wondering if you could just share a little bit of information about how that partnership got started and like, what was your decision-making process for, um, for partnering with ACE? And just, you know, just tell us a little more about, about that. So Jim, we'll start with you just to give an overview well my understanding is that that this has been something that ace has been involved with for for quite some time and um, they've done presentations at uh, our events over the years um, demonstrating that um, most recently at our conference in uh, in las vegas uh, we had uh, folks who are um, iga members as well as uh, on their own talk about uh, how they've partnered uh, and I know some of our other members um, have diversified in this way, uh, and there's a number of options that you can go with. In some cases, um, it's grocery retailers who are just sort of expanding their offerings and opening self-standing, uh, freestanding A stores, uh, and then others uh, employ a store within a store concept where you sort of bring a curated selection of an ACE hardware store into the grocery store itself. Uh, and that becomes, um, as I said, like a store within a store uh, concept within the grocery store. So that becomes like your non-food general merchandise section and it's ACE branded. So the ACE gets the benefit by having a little bit more exposure from its branding and the grocer benefits by being able to leverage that popular branding uh, to move these this additional merchandise and it helps the community because they have yet another source for these types of products whether it's tools or paint or general hardware or you know any you know, in my house a lot of that stuff ends up in the junk drawer but it's there when you need it and um you know it that's it's sort of a win-win-win uh for the community the retailer and uh and uh, the licensee that being ace hardware Thank you, Jim. And then, yeah, 
Bonnie, Theo, what was the decision making process for you? And then at what time did you decide that this was the right move for you? Well, we had purchased the building next door to the grocery store uh, when it came up for auction, um, knowing that there, you know, it was right there. We we should probably do something with it. Our original intention was to create a general store, and um, a few months after purchasing the building, uh, Dollar General announced they were coming to town. So we decided that wasn't a good idea anymore, <laughs> and uh, we um, we started we went through several iterations of ideas in our minds as we we're come, uh, wait, uh, trying to figure out what we we're going to do with it because um, our original plan was uh, derailed. And then um, while we were uh, thinking about it, the uh, there was a local hardware store that went out of business. And well, our community needs a hardware store. So let's let's go there. And Ace already had a relationship with um, Associated Wholesale Grocers um, we, that we had just been sitting on for the whole time because um, there was already a hardware store in town. And there, you know, unnecessary competition isn't what we're about. Um, so we went, once the need was there, we went ahead and went down that road and and um, got the ball ball rolling. For and we had contemplated the uh, store in a store format before, but given our situation, that we had a whole another building, we went ahead and and did the separate hardware store route all right and then uh we've gotten some questions here about the food lockers people are kind of interested in knowing how that got started as well so got a question where did you get the the lockers and what was the source of funding for your pilot program um sure. so yeah if you want to talk about that a little bit well, there's definitely no uh, roadmap for the funding. Um, I would say a best place to start is economic development uh, near you. Um, what, what, whoever those folks are, will probably have some great places to start. Um, whether whether that means um, uh, loans or whether that means grants or maybe in touch with investors, um, it's kind of the three ways to get some things started there. And uh, Starting a pilot program is a lot more difficult than purchasing a grocery store. <laughs> um, yeah. You need to prove that it's going to work. And the only way you can prove that it works is to put it on the ground and make it go. So there's a lot of personal investment as well towards something like this. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to read all of the comments. I yeah. Make sure yeah. So where did you get the lockers? And can you talk a little bit about sort of the technology needs? For the so the lockers, uh, yeah, they came from Wisconsin. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Uh, but um, they came from Wisconsin. Um, Theo did a lot of the technology behind it, um, all of the websites um, developing. He put a lot of work into that. And uh, the, I mean, the if you do a Google search for refrigerated food lockers, there's several companies that that offer them. Mm -hmm. um, they've been around for a while. Um, a, they started out in Europe and Japan, you know, we were talking a decade more or more ago. Um, and then they started to uh, be uh, set in front of grocery stores in America as a convenience um, for folks in a hurry. And, um, and our thought was, why not use this for, you know, how we're how we're doing it uh, as a as a need, we're, as a need, not just a convenience. Yeah. We had a question come in through the chat saying, I am helping a small rural town grocery store that is owned by the town. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest to help this town gain support from the people in town and to keep and to get people to keep coming into the store? And also, do you accept WIC, SNAP, and are you part of the Double Up Food Bucks program? Yeah. So I would say to that town that is doing that, um, we've researched this a lot um, for towns that come together to keep the grocery store open, and it's a wonderful concept. However, what we've seen is when a town does that, um, the person running the grocery store um, might not have grocery experience or doesn't have as much skin in the game. Um, it's a little bit different when your cooler breaks and you own it, you're going to be up at midnight and I'm doing that cooler. Um, when you come together as a town, sometimes um, you don't have quite as much. How am I saying this? Let me say this right. Uh, 
it's just different. You see a lot more shrink and a lot more um, things because they're, they don't put in that extra um, maybe to, to take care of that store. Um, so I would find a good manager um, that believes in the mission. Um, I believe that's what has propelled us to do all of this is on our hearts, this is a mission. Um, we have a grocery store, but it's a mission to serve. And it really takes that extra person to really believe in the mission and to go that extra mile to recruit people to come in from your community. And, and as far as gaining support from the community, um, obviously that's a, that's a huge challenge. Um, if that's a, in particular, if it's a community that lost their grocery store for some time and then they brought it back, um, people have developed new habits and, um, and that's just a reality. And so you're going to have to just try to be as important or awesome as you can be for folks. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and try to get attention wherever people get it, you know, go for information in town, whether that's Facebook or the paper or in the middle of the town square, whatever it takes to be like, Hey, there's really cool things going on in this building over here. Um, and, and we we're trying to take care of you guys and, um, and you just have to keep plugging away at it. It's, it's, uh, several times a day <laughs> effort. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. Well, I know that we had a few more questions come in through the chat. Um, I think we we're going to have to wrap up the Q and a portion right now, but I, I will send those questions over to Bonnie and Theo and see if they might be able to respond in an email maybe, and then we can post the, the answers on our website for you all that who asked questions that we couldn't get to. Um, some questions uh, in particular about um, challenges with dollar stores. And I think maybe Jim would have some insight into that as well from a 30,000 foot view uh, perspective. So we're gonna wrap up the Q&A for right now, but I just wanna thank you, Bonnie, Theo, and Jim so much for being here today. Um, this has been so insightful and inspiring. So thank you so much. Um, we're gonna, we have a few last minute things that we wanna let everybody know about before we let you go. So as always, we have a survey at the end of the webinar um, that's just going to help us know how to improve future webinars. We want to know what was helpful today. What do you want to continue seeing um, in future webinars? So we're going to post a link to that in the chat and should just take you one minute to finish that survey, but it really helps us. Um, next slide. Then we also wanted to remind you that the National Rural Grocery Summit is coming up June 20th and 21st in Wichita. Um, so this is really exciting because this brings grocers and rural stakeholders from all over the nation together to learn from each other and strategize about strengthening rural grocery stores. Um, so we actually have an updated agenda on our website so you can see the different presentations that we'll be having, the different keynote speakers that we are bringing. Um, and we would love to see all of you there. So uh, definitely be sure to register soon because the, the early bird registration rate is gonna be going up at some point. So you'll wanna register and get the early bird rate soon. Gonna post a link to the, uh, to the registration in the chat as well. Um, and then for folks who live in Kansas, we do have scholarships available for you to attend the summit. Um, the scholarships can be used toward registration, lodging and travel. Um, and there is just a brief application on our website that you would need to fill out. Um, so we'll post a link to the chat to that as well. Um, and then finally, I uh, just wanted to let you all know that our next webinar will be May 19th. So we'll see you again in, in a month. We're going to be talking about business transition planning from the purchaser's perspective. So what should your due diligence process be if you are considering buying a grocery store? So what information do you need? What documentation should you ask for? What do you want to know about the market or the community? Um, so we'll be talking about that as well as other considerations to help you decide if that's the right move for you. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you again to Bonnie, Theo, and Jim. 
We really appreciate you joining us today and we will see everybody in a month. Thanks everybody and take care.